some of you, most of you, perhaps all of you, maybe some of you that, that are watching don't know this, but uh, by day, I'm going to sound like a superhero, uh, by day I work at, uh, at, at HopeWorks, which is a counseling center, and we are the counseling arm of Hope for the Heart. And if you're not aware, Hope for the Heart is the ministry of June Hunt. It's about to be 35 years old, and it's a wonderful ministry, and I'll tell you how it got started. June Hunt found Jesus and decided that he wanted her to teach, and so she began to teach, and she would come across these difficult issues, and she would think, well, who can, where can I read? I see this difficult issue, and I've, conf- I've, I've found it in the Word of God. Where is there something that kind of gives me kind of flesh and, and a way to, to live that out? And she found that many difficult subjects, exactly about 150 at this point, uh, there wasn't any, anybody writing on them. So she began to write on these difficult subjects, what you would call the gray areas of life. And so she, she coined a phrase, and her ministry is biblical hope and practical help. You know, biblical hope is practical help. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that, uh, that, that we're going to look at 1 Timothy. For the, let me tell you the joy of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy is sort of the instruction book. It's the owner's manual. How many of you have ever bought a car and never cracked the owner's manual? Come on. Like, I've driven cars, had them almost paid for, and somebody gets in my car and hits a button, and something wonderful happened in my car, and I go, what'd you do? I didn't know that did that. You know, why? Because I never read the instructions. You know, if, if you're going to sail a sailboat, if, if you're going to if you're going to program your remote, if you're going to do probably anything in life, it's going to come with some instructions. And the wonderful thing now is you can get a multitude of instructions. All you got to do is go to Google. They'll tell you how to do a lot of stuff, how to do a lot of stuff wrong. And I, I just get angry at those guys on YouTube because they'll come up with something, you know, you'll have something you're struggling with and you can find somebody doing it on YouTube and it always comes out correct. And then you do it and it doesn't work. I mean, I'm the guy that pays extra to have it put together at the store and delivered. How many years did I spend, you know, I, it, it was a race for, for, for daylight when I bought a, a swing set for my, for my kids. Put them to bed at six and start on the swing set. And I was racing toward daylight to have it together by the time they got up. And then I was scared to get to death for them to get on it because I'd put it together. One of the great things about 1 Timothy, it is a policy book, if you will, on how to do the church. It's our instruction. Now, let me tell you, if you're tuned in or you showed up and you said, man, I hope this is a progressive Christianity that they preach here. I hope, I hope we're in a progressive church. No, we're not. Let me tell you why. Because the instructions teach otherwise. And you say, well, what do you mean by a progressive church? Well, what's being, what's being touted out there is you must be a progressive church. That's the, that's the new phrase. Let me tell you what that means. It means you have a lower view of the Bible. It means that your feelings are emphasized over the facts in, in Scripture. It means uh, essentially that Christian doctrine is open for reinterpretation. It means that uh, historic terms that you've learned to know and love are redefined. And the heart of the gospel message shifts from sin and redemption to social justice. So I'm here to, at the front end, proclaim as long as I'm here, we will never be a progressive church. Hopefully that does not disappoint. If it does, sorry, because... Because it does not disappoint my audience of one, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, with that said, I'm going to give you some of the categories that we've been looking at at 1 Timothy. Because it's, it's, it's made up in categories. It's reading just like your owner's manual to anything that you've ever bought. And he starts out with warnings. He doesn't get to but chapter, or in chapter 1, he doesn't get as far as chapter 3 when he says... 
Now, you got to pay attention, Timothy, because you got people that want to teach something that's contrary from the truth. And so he, he warns him. And, and, and he was vaguely aware of that at that point. And, and then he talks about priorities, and he gives uh, our goals and objectives. And the goals and objectives that he gives Timothy are the same ones we have. And it is to preach the Word of God with a pure heart, with a clear conscience, and with a genuine faith. Those are the priorities of the church. Now, I don't know what other churches are doing or what, how, they, how they decide what their priorities are. Those are the priorities of the church, whether you're following them or not. That we have a pure heart, that we, uh, that, that we have a clear conscience about what we do, and that our faith is genuine. And then he talks about priorities. He gets to chapter 2, and the priorities are not very extensive. The priorities are pray, pray, pray. And what are we praying about? The furtherance of the gospel. And we're praying about the fact that there is one mediator between man and God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's, he's saying it's all about the good news. And let me tell you this. The good news is so good that all other news is irrelevant. Have you figured that out yet? Amen. That'll help you when you turn the news on. You know, I even say to myself now when I, when I turn over the news, let's see what's irrelevant today <laughs> compared to the good news. And so the, he gives his priorities. Then he gives qualifications. And he starts off by giving qualifications of what the pastors to be like and elders and deacons. And then he moves in, into signs of the last days in chapter 4. And he, he, he warns him that some will fall away. And he doesn't mean they're going to wander away a little bit from their faith. He means they are going to fall away. They are going to side with the enemy and become the most dangerous kind of enemy. And so that helps me because I'm not shocked when people fall away. And, and people that you love, people that you have followed, people that have mentored you, maybe have fallen away. And that's just a sign that we are in the last days. And then he talks about widows. And he, and he talks to me in chapter 5, and he, he talks to us about how to treat our elders, how to take care of our widows, and then he's, he's going to give practical wisdom now. He's going to advise us, and all this advice is not going to be a corporate kind of policies and procedures. Uh, like something came up the other day, and, and someone said, well, th well that's not, we're not supposed to do that that way in, according to our policies and procedures. And I said, what? And they said, you've read those. And I went, oh, yeah, those. I mean, I read them. I signed that I read them. I read them fast, though. You know what I mean? They, they look like instructions, so I just went right through them. But, but he's saying, he, he say, he's going to say to us, it's not about putting together something that is going to corporately work. It's about how a family is going to live with each other and how they're going to flourish as a family. And he's going to go on in chapter 6, and he's going to talk to us about responding correctly to authority. And then finally, he's going to talk about the joys, the benefits, and all that comes with a generous heart. The joys of living a godly life. And so that's just a quick summary of the book. Now let me, let me dig into you and tell you the areas that we're going to be looking at just in these few verses of Scripture. I'm going to be in chapter five of first timothy and i'm going to be looking from 17 verse 17 all the way through 25 and and the first thing we're going to look at is he's going to talk about partiality partiality caring uh, for the leaders and making sure that you don't over care for some people you know partiality will kill a church you realize that just like it will ruin a family how many of you when you're raising your kids if you had more than one you heard this. Well, you like him best. You ever heard that as a parent? You know, the one, the one kid is a, as a defense is saying, no, you, you like my brother or you like my sister better. I, I just used to look at him and go, yeah, you're right. You got me. I like them a lot better than you, especially right now. 
Uh, and then, of course, we would go back and talk about, no, I, I love you each in a different way. I love you each for who you are, and you are who you are. So he's going to talk about the dangers of partiality. By the way, uh, you know, you all know this. I pay zero attention to what any of you all give. I don't want to know. I just don't, I don't want to know. I don't want to hear it. I mean, if you give a lot, I don't want to know. If you give a little, I don't want to know. Why? Have you ever thought about the practical reason why? I don't want to have partiality. I am not strong enough that if I know you're giving zero to God and you're complaining nonstop about the church, I don't have the wherewithal to listen. And I don't want to ever be in a position to look at you and say, why are you even talking? You don't give a dime. And I don't want to be in the position to say, whatever it is you want, we got to make it happen because you're such a large giver. I don't want to be in that position. God doesn't want me in that position. And as I look at his book, he's telling me, don't get in that position. So he's going to talk about partiality. And then he's going to say something very practical. And he's going to talk about conflict with leaders. Now, we know Timothy's about 30 years old. And, and Paul has told him, don't let people look down on your youth. And he's struggling with some leaders that he put in place. That's just the way it goes. He got a little quick pulled the trigger early on some leadership, and now he's wishing he could turn that around. And so he's going to give him some advice, and it's practical advice. And then he gives him some ecclesiological, ecclesi he gives him some church stuff. Uh, and, and he's going to tell him the wonderful truth that heaven is watching everything that the body of Christ does. And uh, he's going to give him some ecclesiastical truth. Then he's going to talk to him about a personal matter. And then he's going to give him some physical advice. And the physical advice is about some self-control. So let's dive in. Recogn uh, the recognition of church leaders. He starts in 17. It says, elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. Now, let's land here for a while. Did you ever hear what it says? It says you should pay the preacher well. <laughs> now, I'm a full believer in Scripture. <laughs> I remember one time I was interviewing. I was interviewing at Prestonwood. And, and, of course, they asked me, they said, is there anything you want to ask us? And I said, are you a biblical church? And they said, well, of course we are. And I said, well, you know, because I've had a background working for Levi Strauss. And in the Old Testament, it was the tribe of Levi who handled all the money. And so I looked at him and I said, well, if I come with you and I'm from the tribe of Levi, well, I handle all the money. And they just looked at me and said, he's silly. And that never happened. Uh, but but what, what Paul is saying to Timothy he is saying that, that, that those who teach, especially those who preach and teach, deserve to be cared for. He goes on, he says, uh, for the scripture says, you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it, as it uh, treads, treads out the grain. And in another place, those who work deserve their pay. This is from the mouth of Jesus from the book of Deuteronomy. Throughout scripture, it says, take care of those who take care of you in these ways. Um, this is a good time to ask for a raise. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, you, you all are faithful at this. You're loving at that. And, uh, and, and it's just, it's not a thing. But it's in the book. It's in the advice. And so he is giving him, at this point, uh, that, that advice, and it's, a, it's around the partiality of, of people. You know, sometimes churches, the people of the church become what I call pastor killers or leader killers because they just, they're just so hard on the man of God. They're just so rough on him. They're, the expectation is so high. 
He's supposed to be able to, to counsel you correctly no matter what. He's supposed to be able to love you at the right time, visit you when you're in the right place, care for you in the right way. And it goes on and on and on. And no man can live up to the expectation of some of the parishioners. Can't happen. If it does happen, the man will fall in waste. Just can't be done. And so I'm sure Timothy, with his, with his heart, with his his mercy heart, he was trying to answer every bell, every call, everything that they wanted. And Paul is telling him, take it easy, back off. You need to understand this is, this is not the way God intended for you to lead. There's nothing, nothing more rewarding than to be a pastor of a church or a leader of a church or a teacher of the word of God or a singer of what, he, of, of what he has to say to you. There's nothing greater than that and to be rewarded for it enough so that you can live. Enough so that you can survive. It's not a major problem in our area, by the way. It was a problem in the first century. Today we got pastors making a whole lot of money in some places. But that's not what this is about. It's not just about money either. It's about honor. It's about respect. It's about all the things that we are to do. One of the things I, I, put, a lot of, I put a lot of hope in, I spent years as a layman. I spent years sitting where you're sitting under a pastor. And you know what? I was a good layman. Now, I'm, no, I was a great layman. I prayed for my pastor. I loved my pastor. I would care for anything he needed to be needed care for. And then I became a deacon. And I was a great deacon. I wanted, I wanted to do whatever it was. I was ready to charge hell with a water pistol if that's what my pastor needed. And so, so I speak from a little bit of a little bit of understanding at what I'm telling you. And that always works out. Now, did my pastor always please me? Was it always good? Was it always wonderful? That's not the point. It wasn't about what he was doing. It was about what God called me to do. And Paul is saying in the instruction, God calls the people of God to take care of, number one, the house of God. The house of God includes the man of God. As some of you have come up with great ideas, wonderful ideas, like, hey, let's have a garage sale. And to me, in my, in my head, a garage sale says to the community, we are a small church who can't afford on the basis of what our people give to run our outfit, so we need to sell stuff. Sorry. So that's why we've never had a garage sale. So the ideas of what God is supposed to do and how he's supposed to do it, you know, the household of God comes out of our checkbook, mine and yours. We're going to build a building, and if it's going to happen, it's going to happen because we're going to give to it, and it'll be built. And guess what? Not being built for you. You're building it for those who will come. Amen. Not for us. Never anything for us. Now, we'll enjoy it and tear it up a little bit but it's for someone else. All right, now, he talks about protection and correction in verses 19 and 20. He says, Do not listen to an accusation against an elder unless it is confirmed by two or three witnesses. Let me, let me read that again. Do not listen to an accusation against an elder unless it is confirmed by two or three witnesses. If you would just take that little piece of advice... Out of, the, out of the instruction book, you know, churches wouldn't split. They wouldn't be in arguments. They wouldn't be at odds with each other. If you would just understand somebody is going to say something about somebody else, and if you wouldn't jump in and buy into it, but if you would investigate it, you might find they're not right. You know, an accusation can be the cruelest form of reality. You don't have to be guilty in America he just has to show up on social media. And you're immediately guilty. Or so they assume. They were having problems with some of their leadership. 
People were coming at the pastor willy-nilly saying, wait, he said this, he did that. I saw him over there. They were doing this. They were doing that. They're, you know, and, and Paul is saying, settle yourself, Timothy. Settle yourself. Investigate it on your own. Make sure there is more than just one gossip going off. People can say all sorts of horrid things when they get angry and frustrated, especially now. I've never seen people more anxious and more frustrated at what's going on in in our world than right now. You can tell it when you get on the road. You can tell it, you know, people are just, they're emotionally, they're spent. Their kids are going back to school. Everybody still fears COVID. There's another COVID. They give it an, an additional nasty name. They scare you even worse. The Delta, what is it called? The Delta, the Delta variants. Why couldn't they just say COVID again? I'm just getting used to COVID-19. The coronavirus. Sounds like a beer. (laughs) But the Delta variants. That just sounds like a bad flight to Atlanta. (laughs) Scary. Anything to scare you. So the idea is... Listen, pay attention. Not everything that somebody says bad about somebody is true. You know what? If, if, if somebody comes to me and tells me something about something, somebody I love or somebody that I know, which would be all of you, my first response is, I don't believe you. I don't believe you because I know that person. That is not that person's heart. If something happened between the two of you, you misunderstand. And I'm going to get to the bottom of it. If somebody came to me and told me some tale about WT, he did this or that or the other, my first response would be, no. Nope, that didn't happen. If somebody came to me and said, I was talking to Donna, and she told me, you did this and that and the other, I'd look at you and go, nope. She wouldn't tell you that. She'd tell me, but she would not tell you. And so... He's telling, he's telling Timothy there are gray areas. Not everything is black and white. And so you have this guideline. Stick with the guideline. He goes on, he says, those who sin should be uh, uh, reprimanded in front of the whole church. This, uh, this will serve as a strong warning to others. You know, back in Matthew 18, 15, Jesus told people how to settle your conflict. If you have a conflict with somebody, what do you do? You don't tell somebody else, you go to them. And you tell them what the conflict is. And if they don't listen to you, what do you do? You take somebody else. If they don't listen to that, you take somebody else. And if they're not listening, you bring them before the church. And when sin happens in the church, when it's real, uh, you know, you provide consequences. Consequences. One of the greatest lessons I learned from my parents was consequence. If you do something wrong, we're going to point it out, and then we're going to underscore it with consequences. That's just the way you parent well. That's not a popular way to parent, and the kids certainly hate it, but there has to be consequences, or you never learn how to live a life of order. And Paul is saying there are consequences. I mean, even the old uh, television show, Beretta knew that. Remember that song? If you, if, if you don't do the crime, don't do the crime. If you can't do the time. If, if the punishment is going to hurt you beyond what you think you can handle, then don't do the sin. I hate to oversimplify, but it's the old, uh, if, if that hurts, stop doing it. And so he's telling Timothy in these gray areas, it, it will be found out. And And when you, and he talks about when you reprimand them, you do it in front of the whole church, if the whole church is involved. I remember having to do a reprimand, and and I was invited with two other people to be involved in this man's life. He had made a horrible mistake, and he was part of the leadership. And so it was our job to meet with him and to speak with him and to talk with him about this mistake and to apply consequences. 
We did all that. And I remember we, we were doing it so judiciously that at one point, his wife came in and actually defended him. I remember one of the guys on our team was saying, why does she want to visit with us? And, and, and the, one of them said, well, she wants to tell us what a good job we're doing with her husband. She wants to tell us that she's thankful for us. And I said, no, fellas. She wants to come in and yell at us and be angry at us because we are affecting discipline and consequences on him. Guess who was right? I was right. But you know what? We stayed in that process with that man. And one of the things I'll never forget, we, we told that man when he asked, how long will I be out of leadership? We said, well, there's no prescribed time. It's a, great area, a gray area. We, we're bringing you in for redemption. We're working on the redemptive power of God for you to get through this process, for you to be whole again, for us to bring you back in in full fellowship and in full leadership. And that's our process. And, and so the guy kept pressing, and I said, okay, you're out for at least a year. And if you're out for a year, I'm, I'm guessing if we do our job well, when we come back to you after that year, you will tell us, I am not worthy. And that's when we'll know you're worthy. And you know what I remember? After a year, we had a time together, we had a meal together, and, and we all shared with him, we believe you're ready to be completely restored back into the body, back into your place of prominence, back into your place of leadership, of teaching, and everything that you had done before. We're ready for you to be back. And the man put his head down and looked up at me and kiddingly said, I hate you. And I said, why? He said, because you're right. I don't feel at all worthy. And one of the other men said, that's how we know you're ready. You never were worthy. Amen. But you're ready. You know what I have at my office? It's, it sits out on my desk. I've got a rock. It's about that big. The man brought us a rock, and he had taken red paint, and he would put his thumb in the red paint, and he put it on that rock. It's his thumbprint. And he said, I pray that you keep this and that you're reminded of the restoration you did in a believer's life. So there's a right way to do it. Even though the area is gray, God will give wisdom through the power of the Holy Spirit to do exactly what needs to be done in any situation. And that will protect and correct the body of Christ. Let me tell you what one of the major problems in, in, the, in, in the church, in the Western civilization, they don't know how to do conflict. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retract that. They know how to do conflict because it's in Scripture. They won't do it because they don't want to be unpopular. And so the body of Christ is, is living with this infestation of wrong and sin that needs to be corrected by the church and the church keeps doing this and it gets worse and worse and worse and you lose the power of God from the church into the world when you do that. That's right. And you waste away people who could be restored. That's right. The kindest thing you can do to a person is restore them in Christ. The greatest things I've learned, the best lessons I know anything about came from the time when my parents would give me consequences that I had to live through and survive. And they were serious consequences. And you know what that made me do? It made me not ever do that other thing again. Right? So now he's going to talk to him about how to lead leaders in verses 21 and 22. And he says, I solemnly command you in the presence of God. Well, this is going to be important. Timothy must have started reading that sentence, and he must have thought, whoa, I command, I command you, look, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus and the highest angels to obey these instructions without taking side or showing favoritism to anyone. Now, listen to who Paul evoked. 
He evoked heaven. He sent Timothy, your work is important. Heaven is watching. I command you in the presence of Christ Jesus and, and the highest angels and God himself. You know, in, in Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about we have this cloud of witnesses. And that cloud of witnesses is God, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is his angels. And it is the saints that have gone on before us. And so people say, well, what do you mean? Somebody's watching? Literally not watching, caring about that, but watching, encouraging. Watching like a coach. I never had a coach that, that watched and, and, and discouraged. Right? Rick, you never had a coach in football that did that. You never had a, you never had a coach look at you and say, Fambro, I don't even know why you're throwing the ball. You're going to you're gonna such a terrible quarterback. You can't move. You can't think. You can't make the reads. Why in the world are you doing this? That's not what coach did. The coach said, yes, that's the way to snap that off. Good read. Yeah, right there. Perfect. That's the way we run that. They're encouraging. That's the encouragement we get from heaven. You're doing the right thing. It's a hard thing, but you're doing a great job. The presence of God comes in and, and helps you recognize, stay at the task. Stay with it. You remember when you were in school, they had a person who you'd go into a class, and this one person got favored over everybody else? Remember that one person? It never was me, right? But what do we call that person? Teacher's pet. I bet Monette was a teacher's pet. What do you all think? <laughs> I'm guessing. Just a stab in the dark. But I'm guessing. And what do all the other kids think of that teacher's pet? All the rest of us hoodlums that were in that class? that knew that girl or that guy was going to tell on us no matter what we did. I mean, we're talking about a person that never even put together a good spitball. <laughs> Teacher's pet. Oh, they used to aggravate me because I never was one. My brother was one. Oh, yeah, Larry was always one. And I had to follow him in school. Oh, you're Larry's brother. Oh, that's wonderful. A little further in the semester. Larry Smith's brother? Yeah. You know, and then my parents would come for the meeting and they'd say, is he really from another family? Did you adopt him? <laughs> so he's giving him this advice. And he's saying, under God, under Jesus Christ, under the angels who are all watching what it is you're going to do, is there some importance implied to what he's to do? Don't show favoritism. Don't do it. And then he says, never be in a hurry about appointing a church leader. Do not share in the sins of others and keep yourself pure. Great stuff. Great stuff. Then... He gets to Christian liberty, and in verse 23, out in, you know, in the middle of all this, Paul just throws in this one little deal, sneaks it in. It really doesn't even belong in the, in the flow, but Paul stuck it in right here, and I'm going to tell you why. It says, don't drink only water. You ought to drink a little wine for the sake of your stomach because you are sick so often. Timothy had a chronic problem. And his chronic problem was in his tummy. He had a very nervous stomach. And his stomach needed help. And he knew 
He said, he knew in his, in his heart, Paul's writing to him about leaders. He knew he, was, he knew he was being challenged by leaders. He knew he had to be doing discipline with leaders. He knew he was way outside his comfort zone. He knew nobody was liking him for what he was doing. And he knew that Timothy's stomach had to be given him absolute fits. This is not a verse that okays everybody to go out and drink. Right? Somebody told me they went to a winery one time, and this was on the bottle. <laughs> it's not about alcohol at all. And by the way, it's alcohol he's telling him to do. Because I've heard other people try to argue this away and say, well, this would have been the sweet wine. This would have been the new wine. It wouldn't have been fermented. No, that's, that's got a sugary, sweet taste, and that would have aggravated his stomach. No, this is fermented alcohol. Take a little bit for your stomach. You know, I, I, I wasn't too old before I realized I was getting a shot from my grandmother when I had a cough. Right? That stuff burned going down. And I thought, that's not medicine. That's my grandma's medicine. But it also puts you to sleep. <laughs> hey, you want to shut a little Stevie up? Teaspoon in this. Gone. What he's saying to Timothy is, is he's referencing him toward medicine. Medicine. He is saying to the body of Christ, there is medicine for you out there. Do not avoid taking medicine. It's not wrong to go to the doctor and find medicine that will take your blood pressure and lower it so you won't have a heart attack. That's of God. It's not wrong if you have a kidney problem to take medicine so that your kidneys will function. It's not wrong to take medicine so that your cholesterol doesn't go through the roof and you have fall down of a heart attack. He is saying these are chronic things that go, and, and we are in the early stages of medical care, and the medical care they had at that time was take a little wine for your stomach. It'll settle you down. And medicine has never been more in the news than right now. Right? You all know the medicine I'm talking about. Right? Claritin for your... for when you get hay fever. No, that's not what I'm thinking about. <laughs> that's not what you're thinking about either. There's medicine out there. There's medicine out there for you. And I would encourage you, if, if for some reason you don't feel like you can take the COVID-19 shot, for whatever reason you make that decision, and that's your decision to make. You are a full-grown adult. It's your decision to make, to, to make whether or not you take that shot or whether you don't take that shot. But there are other medicines out there that if you choose not to take the shot, even if you do choose to take the shot, you should still have a round because they will help with that. There's a medicine that they give to people for malaria, and they have found for people who get COVID, it does a great job. There's another thing called oleander, which is from the flower, the old oleander, and you put it under your tongue, and it helps. So I'm not, on, I'm not on a bandwagon sending you one direction or the other. I'm just telling you that the Word of God in this book, in, in the instructions, it says, if you need medicine, get it. I, I, I struggle with people who get, who get ill and they, and they say, well, this is God's will and this is the way I'm going to die. Nope. It doesn't have to be that way. That's right. There are denominations that actually teach that you're wrong if, if, you get, if you get any kind of medication. And, and yet, God has gifted men and women to come up with medications that have kept us alive, and not only kept us alive, but kept the, the level of our life in a better place. And we're to take care of ourselves. So that's just wedged in there. 
Then he goes on, he talks about, you know, you're going to reap what we sow. In 24 and 25, he says, Remember the sins of some people are obvious, leading them to certain judgments. But there are others whose sins are not being revealed until later. A lot of sin is done in secret. I would say most sin is done in secret. And so many people sin and they think because it didn't come to light, it's not ever going to come to light. You need to recognize what Paul is saying here. He's saying, yeah, you can sin and you can get away with it in this world. Maybe nobody ever knows, but it made the headlines in heaven. God knows. God knows. And so often, how, mo- how often have we sat back and we've watched evil flourish and we've, said, and we've said, God, why don't you judge that? Well, we're not on God's timing. We're not on his clock. We don't understand what he understands. But Paul is saying some people sin. It's obvious. You can see it. Others, you may never see it. But have discernment around it. He goes on, he says... In the same way, the good deeds of some people are obvious. And the good deeds uh, done in secret will someday come to light. It's about balance. It's a gray area. You don't stand up and go, look at the good thing I did. Look at the wonderful, wonderful thing I did. No, you just do a wonderful thing for God. And you and God celebrate it. And you also don't sin deeply and keep it to yourself. You confess it to God. You want some great news? Some really great news? If you have sinned in secret, you can go to the Father and be forgiven in secret. And you can live your life godly from that point on. That's good news. That makes all other news irrelevant. I found four hopeful things as I read through the manual. The first hopeful thing is an unseen hope. We have an unseen hope. We have a great cloud of witnesses. Everybody said, you you know, when you die, you don't take anything to heaven. Oh, yes, you do. When you die, you take your love for God, your faith in God. You take your salvation with you to heaven. And the only thing you can do in heaven is praise God and pray for people. Do you realize there's a whole crowd of witnesses that are praying for you? That are before the Father. So there's an unseen hope. There's an earthly hope. And that earthly hope comes in the form of faith. If you're living without hope, it might be because you're living without faith in Christ. You're living without a a living Savior living in your life. But when you come to know Jesus as your personal Savior and the Holy Spirit comes into your life and seals you until the day of redemption and you now have a resident teacher and you have that pure heart, that clear conscience, that living faith that Paul's talking about, that's our earthly hope. And then God tags on to the earthly hope, and we can take care of you through medicine. We can take care of you through other people. In relationships, you can have wonderful relationships where your feelings and your emotions are cared for because you're you're loving somebody who has an empathetic heart. You're in a church where people will love you and nurture you and care for you and want want what's best for you. There is an earthly hope. We don't live void of hope. You can't. You can live a while without water. You can live a while without food. But you cannot live without hope. And there is hope in Jesus. There is hope in his church. There is hope in the people that make up the church. So we have an earthly hope and an unseen hope. And then we have a physical hope. There's help for you. One of the largest ministries to take off lately is, uh, is Celebrate Recovery. For those who have gotten caught up in drugs and alcohol and all other kind of mess, and and God gives a physical hope (coughs) through Celebrate Recovery. There's physical hope in your body, no matter how bad you've battered it, no matter how many awful things you've put into it, no no matter the amount of sugar that now exists in you, which is about a pound and a half after I visited what Carol has in there. 
and Donna's peanut butter roll. That's a sugar fest. I can tell which one of you have had that. My son loves that. Donna takes it down to him, and he, he takes it into the shop, and he said to her the other day, he said, Mom, the guys know what's, what the ingredients are, but they, they can't figure out one ingredient. They know that one ingredient is peanut butter, and they want to know what the white ingredient is because they think it's cocaine. <laughs> it is. It's sugar. I've never tried cocaine, but I know sugar's better. But you know, you can abuse your body. You can couch potato it out. You can eat the wrong stuff for years. And then all of a sudden, you can get on a, on a different path. And God will begin to heal your body. Do you know the brain is an unbelievable thing? And, and, and I've seen pictures of the brain, a brain on alcohol. And then, and then they show the same brain that has been without al alcohol for six months. And you wouldn't believe how cleared up it is. And after a year, it's all gone. Any trace of alcohol, gone. Same thing in your lungs. You have, may have smoked for years, and you quit smoking, and your lungs begin to clean themselves up. It's, a, it's not a medical miracle. It's a miracle of the way you were made. You were made in God's image, and at any point, you can have a physical hope. No matter how bad it is, you can have physical hope and know that God will care for you. You do your part, he'll do his part. And then lastly, there's relational hope. Relational hope. Comes in the form of reconciliation. You may have prodigaled away from God. You may be part of the, part of the problem, not part of the answer, and you know it. And you have, you have just kind of wandered away from the love of God. You've just sort of drifted, gone about your own way, your own selfish way. And, and Paul is, is encouraging Timothy, don't, don't do that. Stay in the business of reconciliation. That's what all this is about. Stay in relationship. Work hard on the relationships that God has given you. Work hard on the relationships that come into your life. Work hard on those people that come into your life who are irregular. Got any of those? Know any people that just show up and mm, grade you the wrong way? Anybody you need to reconcile with? Anybody you need to go to and say, you know, I, I didn't treat you right. I didn't, I didn't do what was right by you under God. And I'm sorry. To care for one another in such a way that the empathy of God is expressed in the relationship. That's really what Paul is teaching young Timothy. He's teaching young Timothy how to be compassionary, not reactionary. How to have an empathetic thought of another person. How to really, truly love people. You want the hope of Christ? You want the joy of the Holy Spirit? It's all done. It's all worked out in your relationships. Show up, Christian Strong, in your relationships. Father, help us. Help us to read your book, to see your manual. Help us to recognize in all these difficult gray areas of life, you answer with clarity, with love. And then you empower by the Holy Spirit for us to do the things that you are directing us to do. And so, Father, we have an opportunity always to confess to you our sin in secret. We have the opportunity to come to you and, and, and find you for salvation and trust in you and you alone. We have the opportunity to work our salvation out and to reconcile and to love greatly. 
Father, give us that kind of courage. Give us that kind of strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. God, make us all great lovers of one another and show our love for you. I remember uh, you said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. The second is like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. Father, help us to know that you love us, and because you love us, we can love ourselves, and because we love ourselves, we can love others. It is the only answer, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That good news makes all other news irrelevant. Father, thank you for the good news. In Jesus' name, amen.